Okay, welcome to Ask the Expert. Today we're talking with Jack Verosco, PhD at UTX Austin, and he's going to talk about um, imaging the pancreas in type 1 diabetes, monitoring the crime scenes or tongue in cheek, but he it has some very serious work. He's a biomedical engineer who applies medical imaging to learn more about type 1 diabetes. He has experience with MRI, nuclear imaging, and optical imaging across preclinical and clinical studies. He got his BS in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech and his master's and doctorate in biomedical engineering from Vanderbilt University. And following completion of his PhD, he received a postdoctoral training at Vanderbilt Institute of Imaging Science and a master of science in clinical investigation. So a really a lot of great training coming to bear on um, type 1 diabetes. And in 2016, he joined the um, newly formed Dell Medical School at University of Texas, Ox, Austin. In his free time, he can be found swimming and camping with his three children. So welcome, Jack. Thanks for joining us and um, look forward to um, seeing what you've got here. Hey, thanks so much for the, the invitation to come speak here. Hopefully my uh, slides are showing up here. Somebody Looks great. Tell me if they don't, but uh, you know, I think it kind of came out in my introduction there, but I'm, I'm you know, maybe not a, a typical person to be talking about type 1 diabetes. I'm an, I'm an engineer and I'm really an imaging scientist. And so as kind of a community, as, a, as imaging scientists, we use imaging techniques like MRI, like optical imaging, like nuclear imaging. We design new imaging techniques that tell us new things about uh, uh, that we may be able to image. And then we apply those. So we apply them to different diseases that are of interest. So in the kind of imaging science communities, there's really two really big groups. So there's kind of the neuroimaging community. So people who are really, really interested in imaging the brain, they work with neurologists to try to understand more about stroke or neuropathologies. Uh, they often work uh, kind of hand in glove with psychologists. So they image brain function and actually image you know, how, how, what, uh, what kind of the thought patterns are in response to different stimuli. So that's kind of the neuroimaging crew. There's another really large uh, imaging cadre of oncology imaging people. So people who are interested in imaging tumors. They're interested in using uh, MRI PET imaging to detect tumors. They're interested in using those techniques to perhaps uh, image how tumors respond to therapy. And so I think that, you know, a lot of, of work in imaging has kind of been spearheaded among those, those kind of application groups. Now, the people who are, who are kind of imaging scientists who are, who are interested in imaging diabetes is a much, uh, a much smaller uh, group currently. Uh, those who are really applying imaging to type 1 diabetes, even smaller yet. But I hope that I can convince you over the next half hour that there's a home for us here in, in kind of type 1 diabetes and that a lot of these tools that have been applied for neuroimaging, for cancer imaging, may have a lot of applicability uh, in diabetes and help us both uh, kind of advance our understanding of diabetes, as well as possibly playing a role uh, in clinical uh, diagnosis and management in diabetes. Well said. All right. So I, I indeed, I kind of did this kind of cheeky uh, title, hoping to be provocative here that the pancreas is the crime scene in type 1 diabetes, but we don't really assay it, right? And you think about how we diagnose uh, type 1 diabetes, we're really typically looking at the blood, right? We're looking at blood glucose values, we're looking at A1C, maybe perhaps are looking at, at insulin, uh, C-peptide measurements. We're really not looking at the, the pancreas per se, right? And that's because the pancreas is a lot harder to look at than blood, right? The pancreas is kind of buried deep uh, in the abdomen. It's tough to get to. Uh, it's, you don't want to biopsy the pancreas. In fact, I've been told by surgeons that like one of the rules they, they hear the, the first week of surgery, surgery residency is don't touch the pancreas, right? Because if you, mm. you disturb the pancreas, often it can lead to pancreatitis. Uh, but if we, we look at kind of what we think is the, the presumed uh, natural history of type 1 diabetes, we think that people are, are perhaps maybe born with some genetic susceptibility, but they initially have kind of their, their normal beta cell mass. So they have this kind of 100% of, of their kind of starting initial beta cell mass. And then there's some triggering event that triggers this autoimmune process, right? And at that point, the immune system is starting to attack the beta cells and kill off those, those cells that are the, really the only cell in the body capable of making insulin, right? 
And so if we think about kind of what this looks like over time, it probably takes a, a while, right? It's probably this, this long autoimmune process. And some people it might take months, it might take years. We don't really know how long this takes because we, we can't really assay the pancreas. We actually don't know what's happening to the beta cells over time. But uh, suffice to say that we're not actually detecting uh, clinical diabetes until someone's probably been losing beta cells for, for quite some time. And depending on what model you look at, they might have been losing um, a whole uh, a majority of their beta cells before they come up with an abnormal blood glucose. So some models say, you know, you're, you're not diagnosed as, as uh, um, altered blood glucose until you've lost half of your initial beta cell mass. Others say, hey, it's, maybe it's closer to 90% of this initial beta cell mass. The thought is that there's this kind of initial compensatory uh, capability of these beta cells. And actually, you know, like as early as 2007, Matthias von Herreth and Kevin Harold had a great paper, you know, type 1 diabetes is a relapsing remitting disease. Um, and then just recently a group, um, you know, Viva Nan's group together with uh, IBM Watson put out this whole, you know, sort of biomarker parade one after the next after the next. So this whole prodrome uh, piece is getting, you know, kind of much more attention now. And um, so I think it's a great place to have your science looking at it. Yeah, and I've shown, you know, a very simplistic model that it's this kind of, uh, you know, gradual decline over time. But, you know, in reality, yeah, maybe it is this relapsing remitting, maybe there's this oscillatory uh, sort of decline and regrowth of beta cells. And, you know, we, we, we really don't know. Mm -hmm. but, but when I started, so when I was in graduate school, I worked with an endocrinologist. So I was an imaging scientist, I was doing engineering kind of things. I was working with somebody who was really interested in uh, biomedical optics. And he started talking to an endocrinologist who said, well, let's use imaging to measure beta cells. And he presented a model that probably looked very similar to, to this to me. And I said, hey, you know, this is, we obviously need a tool like this. We need a way to image beta cells, right? And so that's kind of the, the path I got started on, on in graduate school. And so my kind of first project that I really worked on uh, throughout the kind of majority of my PhD studies uh, was trying to make a technique that we could actually image beta cells, at least in mice to start with, right? And so what we initially started with was we made a, a transgenic mouse where we expressed the, the luciferase uh, gene that, that makes fireflies glow. We expressed that under the insulin promoter and we could actually make the beta cells in mice glow. And then using this really cool camera that, that was super sensitive and could detect very small amounts of light, we could actually detect that light coming out from the pancreas of these mice. And I'll say, you know, when I was a grad student, you know, and I, I had these visions of being a mad scientist, you know, one of my favorite parts of this project was to, to actually take these images. Uh, we used to actually have to actually pour liquid nitrogen onto the camera mm. to cool it down enough so we could actually take these images. And so that was always kind of a, a cool part of my the early days of, the, of using this technology because we'd have these huge canisters of liquid nitrogen and pour it into these and it kind of comes spilling out over the floor. It kind of looked like we were building a haunted house there in the lab there. Um, so it's so really cool. But so that was kind of how so I got are these are, are these are nod mice then or so what this, is there? Yeah, so this background was initially just on an FVB background. We crossbred okay. these with an NOD mouse model. Right. So we could also look at kind of how, what beta cell dynamics look like in, in the NOD mouse model. And we saw kind of, as we'd expect, this kind of decline in beta cell mass over time. We also bred it with um, DBDB mice, OB, OB mice, uh, kind of looked at different diabetic models. We also did some treatments with these uh, animals. So. Uh, subjected them to, I guess at the time we were looking at some of the extenatide uh, sort of molecules, trying to see if we could image beta cell proliferation. We also transplanted these glowing islets into other mice so we could image these transplanted islets. So it did, did a lot of cool uh, sort of preclinical work. But at the end of the day, this was a technology that we could only really apply to mice, right? I see a question in the chat. Let me pull this up real quick. Oh, no, I just said, feel free to ask okay. for Thank anyone you. in the audience to unmute yourself or ask a question at any time. Yeah, please, please uh, interrupt me freely here. Um, so that was uh, kind of the, the, the genesis of how we got started. And then at that point, kind of moving into my postdoctoral work, I wanted to... Um, to kind of 
move from a tool that could only be used in mice to something we could do in people. So optics is great in mice, right? We can make a transgenic mouse. We can do that in a human. We can image light coming out through a mouse because it only has to go through a little bit of skin, right? But we can't do that for a person. So when you think about translating these kind of what we call kind of molecular imaging, which typically means you're imaging some molecular event. In the case of these transgenic mice, we're, we're imaging insulin, insulin transcription. You know, when you think about moving those kind of tools into people, we often think of using nuclear imaging because nuclear imaging is also able to image typically small amounts of things. You think of things like PET imaging, SPECT imaging, all these techniques take some molecule that binds to some target of interest and they tag that molecule with a radioactive particle. You can then image the radioactive emission from that particle after you've ejected it into a, a person or in our case for these initial studies into to mice and you could see where that particle is going. And so typically when you think of PET imaging, if you think of going you know, to the radiology clinic today and going to get a PET image, uh, you're often going to get an FDG PET image. FDG is just uh, radioactive uh, glucose. It's a radioactive glucose that actually gets trapped in the cell. So it's really nice because it accumulates and then stays there. Uh, and it's been really useful to track where uh, there are high levels of metabolism, right? So for instance, if you have a tumor that has a really high amount of glycolytic activity, this FDG tracer is going to bind there and it's actually going to get trapped there. And when we think about targets that might be of interest in the beta cell or perhaps the, the pancreatic islet cells more generally, we you know, started thinking, well, an islet has these kind of neuroendocrine features. It has these, these transporters. It has these um, molecules that maybe are expressed in the islet cells that aren't expressed in the rest of the exocrine pancreas. And so we looked at a number of these radio tracers that often had been kind of designed for more for kind of um, neurological imaging uh, purposes, but we've tried to repurpose those and see if they image the beta cell, right? And it seemed like this, this nice uh, serendipity that, that, you know, you could say, well, these, these beta cells or these islets have some of these neural features. And luckily there's already a number of, of radio tracers um, that bind to neural cells. And so we did some work uh, looking at a number of these, uh, you know, the, the, the final story is that ultimately we were pretty unsuccessful with them. This is showing a, an example image uh, where we were trying to, to uh, use a, a tracer that targeted the vesicular monoamine transporter type two, which was, it is expressed in beta cells. Unfortunately, when we took a radio tracer that was very specific for um, those cells. So for instance, when we inject this, these radio tracers, they show up really brightly in the striatum. So you can actually see they're binding to those neural, neural cells, but they don't tend to bind to the beta cells or to the islet cells. Or if they do, they do it in too small amount uh, to, yeah. really be, to really be useful as a tool. And that's, you know, that's one of the limitations in, in these kind of techniques is you need something that's really, really highly sensitive for your target and really uh, specific for your target, right? You need something that's not going to bind to the exocrine pancreas, you're going to need something that's not going to stay at high levels in the blood. So it's already always just going to be circulating. Uh, these kind of methods, when we talk about translating them to, to people, we're also limited by the, the location of the pancreas, right? The pancreas is kind of nestled in there between the liver and the kidney. Most of these radio tracers get cleared out through the liver and the kidney. So you're dealing with this, this kind of clearance of your, your, um, your target uh, radio tracer from all these organs that are kind of surrounding the pancreas. Now that said, we didn't have good luck with it. Uh, we've kind of transitioned um, away from PET uh, and nuclear imaging, but there are a lot of groups still pursuing this and a lot of people much smarter than me are having some success with it. And, and I think, you know, in the, you know, hopefully within the, the decade, there'll be kind of uh, radio tracers that are shown to be beta cell specific and may be able to image beta cells non-invasively in people. Jack, what, what groups are doing those that type of work? So there are a number of groups. So Yale had been doing work in this field. Uh, there's a group uh, at Columbia that actually kind of pioneered this uh, vesicular mono monoamine transporter work. Uh, there's a group in, um, in Sweden 
uh, at Uppsala, who's doing a whole lot of kind of really, really great work in that field. And so yeah. they, they've been ha they've been having some good success. They have a, a really strong pet center there as well. Thanks. All right. So that's kind of optical nuclear imaging. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about MRI. And uh, MRI is, is nice because you don't have to inject anything. It doesn't require any radiation. So there's no ionizing radiation that can end up uh, damaging DNA and possibly leading to, to, to cancers in the future. So MRI is thought to be generally safe and it's thought to be generally safe for kids to have as well, right? It's not like an X-ray where they're exposed to radiation or nuclear imaging where they're again exposed to radiation. Now, the, the interesting thing uh, that MRI might be useful for is that the pancreas is actually smaller in type 1 diabetes. This has actually been known for going on 70 years now. There was a Belgian pathologist who was doing autopsies, and he found that when he did an autopsy of somebody who'd had type 1 diabetes for a long time, an autopsy of somebody who did not have any known pancreatic disease, he found that the pancreas of those individuals who had had type 1 diabetes was markedly smaller, and it was smaller by about 30 or 40 percent. So, you know, a really, really drastic reduction in the size of the pancreas, certainly implicating that there's probably more going on in the pancreas than just the loss of, of just the, that, those beta cells that make up, you know, one to two percent of the pancreas here. Now, the good thing uh, now is medical imaging can, can actually make really nice images of the pancreas. So those of you who don't kind of stare at, at MRI uh, images all day, I kind of walk you through this image on the left. This is a, a 10 year old boy. He weighs 64 pounds. Uh, he's lying on his back. So his spine is down here. This big organ over on that kind of left side is his liver, of course. His stomach is right here. And interestingly, you can see he probably just ate lunch because he's lying on his back. All the food is down at the bottom of his stomach. You can see <laughs> the top of his stomach is still full here. Spleen is over here. And our pancreas is right here. So it's kind of butting up against the, the edge of the spleen here. We typically kind of in a very non-scientific non way say that the, the pancreas looks somewhat like a fattened banana when you kind of look on an MRI scan. Um, however, if you look at uh, somebody who has type 1 diabetes, so on the right, this is, uh, again, a 10-year-old boy. He had to weigh the exact same amount. So again, 10-year-old boy, weighed 64 pounds. This individual had just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and he'd been diagnosed uh, within the last month. So this is kind of a, a new onset uh, type 1 diabetic. And you can see, again, I've outlined his pancreas in red. You can hopefully appreciate it's markedly smaller. So if we kind of go across all the different slices of the pancreas of this boy and kind of sum up how much volume there is in that it's comprised of pancreas tissue, you can see it's about 40% less pancreas. His, his pancreas is about 40% smaller than this boy who's same age, same weight, but doesn't have type 1 diabetes. Hopefully also appreciate that the shape is different here, right? So we talk about kind of the control pancreas being this fattened banana. Oftentimes we kind of talk about the type 1 pancreas being kind of like a, a constricted banana, especially kind of through the body of the pancreas. And, you know, this was a kind of a finding that, that we kind of noticed anecdotally. So we work with a, a radiologist who we send these images to. She outlines the pancreas so we can get all the contours and accurately define the, the volume of the pancreas. She's blinded to whether somebody has diabetes or not when we send her these images. So we just give her the images and it has some, you know, identifier on it, but it doesn't signify whether that person has diabetes or not. And, you know, it, uh, pretty early into this, this um, project, after we probably scanned, you know, 20 or 30 people, she said, you know, I know I'm blinded to this, to the status of whether somebody has diabetes or not. But, you know, anecdotally, I think I can tell because I get an uh, image that looks like this, where the pancreas is, again, this kind of fattened banana shape. And I'm pretty sure that that's the pancreas of somebody who doesn't have diabetes. However, when I get this, these MRIs and I look through it and I outline the pancreas and it's more kind of like this snake shape, she says, you know, I, I think that that's most likely somebody with type 1 diabetes. And we kind of, you know, tested her. We said, well, who do you think this is? And, you know, just on her kind of best estimate here, uh, she, was, she was pretty good at guessing uh, which one was which. All right. So I think one of the interesting things is not only is the pancreas uh, affected in people who have type 1 diabetes, it's certainly affected in people who have longstanding disease. Uh, it seems to be smaller at disease diagnosis, 
but it also seems to be smaller in people at risk for getting type 1 diabetes. So we've been working with the type 1 diabetes trial on that, imaging the pancreas of people who have multiple autoantibodies. So they have, I think on average, about a 50% chance of getting the disease over the next five years. And what we find is that their pancreas size is somewhat intermediate. It's kind of a little smaller on average than the pancreas size of a control. And it's a little larger on average than the pancreas size of somebody with type 1 diabetes. But I think one thing that's evident when you look at this kind of dot plot here is how much variation they, there is in all of these uh, populations, right? So there's some people who are controls who have a pretty small pancreas for their body weight. And I should note that if you kind of look at the y-axis, this is that, that pancreas volume index. We simply take the, the volume of that person's pancreas and we divide it by their body weight. So pancreas volume tends to scale mostly linearly with body weight. Mm -hmm. But when we do this, there's a pretty good overlap between the group. And there's a pretty big uh, distinct, um, or there's a pretty big range of pancreas sizes among these people who we think are at, at high risk for getting the disease. And so we continue to follow them. What we think, and we've, we've had a couple of these people go on to progress to you know, overt stage three type one diabetes. And we think it's these people who tend to have a small pancreas who are at most, uh, at highest risk of, of uh, converting to stage three type one diabetes. So we think that, you know, maybe there's some, some role here in some sort of predictive sense in that having a small pancreas may be predictive of kind of progressing on to, to stage three type one diabetes. All right, so there's this saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So we kind of go through our pancreas movie that we're scanning through right here. And you know, with the data I've shown you right now, we look at all these measurements, we outline the pancreas and we say, all right, this is what the pancreas volume is. There you go. But you know, I hope that if we spend all this money, take all this time to get this pretty image, that there's a lot more we can measure from this than just the size of the pancreas. So I think the analogy for those who aren't used to, to looking at medical images is in histology, right? So if we look at this immunohistochemistry of an islet, Certainly we can measure the size of the island, that might be informative, but we can also look at the shape. We can use different, uh, different antibodies to, to scan for different hormones. We can tell beta cells apart from alpha cells and delta cells and the spatial relationships. You know How these are arranged is probably important. So we can do analogous things uh, with these medical images as well. So for instance, I think I've already kind of tipped my hand a little bit here. We think the pancreas shape is different in type one diabetes. So these are kind of 3D uh, representations of the pancreas shape of somebody with type 1 diabetes on the top row. And on the bottom, this is a control individual. So the red is kind of the volume of their pancreas. We can do different techniques to try to quantify this. We can draw a bounding box around this. So just a three-dimensional box. How big would this box have to be to fit this person's pancreas? And then within that box, what percent is filled with pancreas? So this is kind of a, a way to kind of to, to get at kind of the sparsity of, it, of a, a, a 3D shape here. Instead of a box, you know, the pancreas is certainly not box shaped, but we can draw a convex hull that basically, you know, how big of a balloon could we get that kind of fits around this pancreas, right? And again, we can quantify how big that hull is and the solidity of that hull. So how much of that hull is filled with the pancreas? Or we can basically take an ellipsoid, fit that around the pancreas and look at the principal axes. And that's going to give us some 3D representation of, of how um, spatially the pancreas has changed. So is the pancreas, is it shrinking like a balloon losing air? Is it losing that, that uh, volume isotropically? Or is it kind of shrinking from the kind of the longest, from the head to the tail that way? Or is it more shrinking like the body of the tail is being constricted? So these are ways to, to try to kind of quantify these kind of complex 3D shapes. Now I mentioned that, that in immunohistochemistry, we can look at different contrasts. We can do the same thing in MRI. So when you, you say uh, getting an MRI image, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to adjust that contrast. And people like myself who do kind of uh, this kind of uh, imaging scientist work have realized, hey, if we kind of change these parameters on the MRI scanner, we can get measurements that are sensitive to the cell density, or we can look at the fat content of the tissue, or we can give us measurements that maybe look at fibrosis or inflammation in a tissue. Now, the nice thing about these measurements, we don't have to inject anything. We just change the way that we take the image and then process that data. The other nice thing is we can do them all at the same time. So we stick somebody in the MRI scanner, we have them in there for 30 or 40 minutes. Not only can we measure the size and shape of their pancreas, 
you take all these other measurements as well and look at each spot in the pancreas and see what the, the kind of corresponding MRI metric that's sensitive to fat, to inflammation. So I'm just going to show one example image. This is a, a technique called diffusion weighted MRI. It's actually used clinically to, 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 for stroke imaging and for cancer imaging. When we do this kind of imaging in the pancreas, what we find is that the control pancreas, the diffusion looks somewhat homogeneous. So it all looks blue and green. And a homogeneous uh, apparent diffusion coefficient value and a low ADC value typically means that the, the, the cells are pretty well packed together, right? It means water's not really moving around. Now, conversely, when we look at these kind of measurements in the pancreas of somebody who has type 1 diabetes, we see all these yellow spots. And what these mean to us is that this is, these are areas that the water is really moving around. And we typically see this in areas of inflammation, which we might be expecting to see in the pancreas of people with type 1 diabetes. So maybe we're actually mapping inflammation in real time. And now we're hmm. working on, on kind of these machine learning and deep learning techniques that can do a lot better job than the you know, the human visual system at quantifying the difference between these, these two sets of images. So the last thing I'm gonna close on is just saying that we're kind of making these measurements now at multiple sites. And there's a lot of kind of work that needs to go into that to standardize those so that you can make these same type of measurements here in Austin as we can make in Nashville or Colorado or Chicago, or we're even working with a group in Melbourne to try to make these measurements. And the thought is that we think maybe these measurements might be useful for clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. And when they are, we want to be able to make multi-site measurements uh, as part of these multi-site clinical trials. And then I'll kind of close here by just thanking the, the people who all uh, did this work. JDRF was really instrumental in getting these, uh, these studies off the ground. And now DK, DKNet and IDDK and the Beetson Foundation have uh, continued to to um, fund these studies. And so I'm happy to take uh, questions if uh, there's time permitting, and hopefully I've come a little bit of a way convincing you that, that there's a, hopefully a, a use for medical imaging in the type one diabetes uh, community. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that there, you know, it, it could be, you know, a really great way to expand the knowledge base as you kind of capture people entering the prodrome and as they progress through the prodrome. Um, there's also this whole idea, right, that different areas, the head versus the tail, are more under attack. And so those could be carefully, you know, looked at, creating a repository. It's really fantastic what you guys are putting in place. Um, what do you think about this idea of implementing the imaging, like the diffusion weighting MRI, like just getting it on board for new onset patients? Who would pay? Um, you know, is it even a possibility or does it have to be in a clinical like study setting? Yeah, that, you know, that's one of the, the questions I always get asked is, you know, well, MRI is great, but it's expensive, right? It's a thousand dollars, right? Uh, some mm -hmm. centers, it's more than that, right? So who pays and, and who are the, who are the, the kind of interesting populations to image? I think initially it's going to be um, kind of clinical trials. I think it's going to be, I think one of the really interesting things is to see if it's able to, uh, to track therapeutic response. I know in the type two diabetes community, there's a Roy Taylor's group in the UK uh, looked at successful therapy. And what he found is that responders had uh, actually an increase in their pancreas size and that preceded uh, their response to therapy. So it might be this kind of early indicator of successful treatment. And when you, you know, when you kind of work out the, the uh, kind of economies there of, of where expensive MRI might be justified, I think that, that you know, guiding therapeutics that they themselves might be costing, you know, multiples of thousands of dollars might be a really uh, interesting uh, place to look at. Uh, stratifying different patient populations for clinical trials might be really interesting as well. You know, in terms of everybody who's newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, getting an MRI as part of their standard of, of care, you know, I think we're a, a, a long way off from there if, if we're ever going to get there. And, you know, there might not be a use for that. But I think uh, one of the, the interesting things MRI might tell us about is uh, kind of different isoforms of, of diabetes and of type yeah, 1. Yeah, endotypes. Different endotypes. endotypes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like companies like Prevention Bio and, you know, others that are interested in kind of, you know, cutting things off at the, before, uh, di bef you know, extending remission or cutting things off before diagnosis, I think would be very interested in, in kind of mapping changes early on and maybe ma even mapping changes to um, in response to their clinical intervention. So, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. What's the story with the ML that you're 
Like, how are you guys implementing that? I mean, is there paper coming? What's going well, on there? Hopefully soon. So we've done a little bit of work. So there's, we're really using machine learning for two different things, you know? So one thing is we're training. I mentioned that we have a radiologist who has kind of painstakingly gone through there and manually segmented the pancreas on over 500 people. Now I think we're approaching 600 people. In fact, she was doing more uh, segmentations this morning. It's a really time consuming job. Right. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if we think about doing this in kind of a multi site trial where maybe you're going to enroll hundreds, if not thousands of patients, right? At some point, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be too big a job for one radiologist to read all those images. So we're That's using really machine learning. We're basically showing the, the um, algorithm. So there's a, a technique called UNETs that are really good at image segmentation. We're showing them all these images that our radiologist has manually segmented the pancreas. Then we're showing it images that it hasn't seen before and asking it to segment the pancreas and seeing how well those uh, those images correspond. How well does the machine learning algorithm accurately uh, segment the pancreas versus a, um, uh, 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 a radiologist here? And we just we had pretty good success with that. Basically, they they overlaid themselves almost identically. We do a kind of a similarity measurement called the dice coefficient that that represents how well the two things overlap one another. And those were in the 0.9 range. So that's pretty good. So we're about 90% accurate, which is pretty good. And we're really only missing at the margins. And when I, when I look at the pancreas, I actually think that in some cases, our machine learning algorithm is outperforming the radiologist, right? So we take the radiologist as this gold standard, but the radiologist is going through and, and you know, maybe she's got a little shaky hand, she had a little too much coffee one morning. And you can kind of see where some of those contours are a little bit off when you actually really zoom in on the image. That doesn't happen with the machine learning algorithm. You know, it follows every little contour of the pancreas down to the, you know, the voxel there. It's down there on the millimeter level, getting it exactly right. So I think that's one place that machine learning uh, is gonna be really useful. We've published that work already. Uh, in BMC medical imaging earlier this year. So that, that has been published. The other kind of machine learning uh, uh, job is classifications. So that is kind of telling apart uh, these kind of complex image sets where you know, we're kind of limited with, with the amount of analyses we can do, right? So if you look at this, uh, if I can go back to this really complex image, right? So this is telling you a lot of different things. It's telling you about the shape, right? So the shape is different between these two. It's telling you about in the image world, we call this the, the texture, right? So how homogeneous or heterogeneous is this? You know, for us, there's ways we can quantify this, but there's a, you know, you can imagine there's a multitude of different ways to, to, to do this. So what we're doing is showing algorithm, these computer algorithms, a bunch of pancreases that look like this saying, all right, this is a control pancreas. We're showing it a bunch of pancreases that look like this and saying, all right, this is the pancreas of somebody with type one diabetes. Now here's a pancreas you've never seen before. What does this look more like? Mm -hmm. we're, we're teaching it. Yeah. yeah, we're teaching it. With those, we're at about 90% accuracy. These computer learn, these machine learning techniques are, you know, improving by the year, if not by the month. So our hope is that just on the algorithm development side, we'll improve. We're also getting new data. The more you train the algorithm, the better it's going to do. And now we're thinking about applying this away from kind of a binary classification, right? Type one versus control. What about when we look at the autoantibody positive population? What right. if we look at the autoantibody positive population of people who progress to type 1 diabetes? Yeah. Do they have this imaging signature that looks different from the people that didn't progress? And so, you know, I think one of the things that's important to remember with MRI images is that, yes, we can get the size of the pancreas, but hopefully for that $1,000 or whatever we're paying for it, we're getting a lot more readouts that are better, better able to characterize the pancreas than just the size alone. And you know, our kind of initial forays into that indicate that that is the case, that if you combine not only the size of the pancreas, but the shape, these kind of measurements of the diffusion, we'll do a lot better job of kind of teasing apart those, those groups and we won't have as much overlap as we do when looking at just the size alone. Are you gonna be able to drill down and like, you know, at the level of alpha versus beta cell loss? I think that'll be difficult. Uh, you know, when we're kind of looking at our kind of spatial resolution, we're typically getting, you know, four millimeter slices and then a millimeter resolution in in uh, the the in in plane direction. So you know, we're we're well above the resolution of a, a, a beta cell. So these you know these areas that we're seeing, 
these are not corresponding to a single islet that's inflamed. These are presumably, you know, some lobular, some region of the pancreas that, that is undergoing an inflammatory process. It's more macro. And then, but still very important. Um, you have a question here. Nice presentation from Sami Muhammad. What are your thoughts on SPECT imaging using radio labeled extend in four? Can MIR be combined with other imaging techniques like multimodal imaging? Yeah, they certainly can. So that's a, you know, and that's a, a, a big field in terms of in kind of neuroimaging and cancer imaging is kind of multimodal work, right? Combining MR, combining CT, which often give us kind of functional or structural imaging with things like nuclear imaging, like SPECT, that can give us more of kind of a molecular signature. Uh, I definitely think that there's a, uh, a role for that in the diabetes field as well. The uh, kind of radio labeled Extendin, you know, my sense is that it will be uh, useful for telling apart people with no beta cells versus people with kind of a that hundred percent beta cells. My sense is that that the the ability to discriminate small changes in beta cell mass might be limited. Oftentimes, when we talk about PET and SPECT imaging, we typically look at a, about a twenty percent test retest variability. So you take the same person, nothing's changed in them, but you do a PET image on them one day, have them come back tomorrow and do the same sort of PET imaging, you might have about 20% variability just in that signal. So I think it's going to be hard to detect changes in beta cell mass, you know, certainly less than 20%, maybe you could do 50%. I, I think that, that, that that's still, you know, under debate. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that that those studies are going to probably target different populations than MRI. MRI is nice because we can do it in kids. We can do it repeatedly for longitudinal imaging. Those uh, kind of SPECT and PET scans, uh, I think it would have to be on, on much more tailored population where the kind of risk to, to benefit uh, is a little more well-established. Yeah, and uh, a majority of the diagnoses of type 1, you know, occur in a pediatric population. So this will be give a lot of good numbers. You know, in terms of, you know, it's a, you'll be able to sample a lot of individuals. So, yeah, I mean, this is great. You know, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thanks for going over time. I appreciate your time. And um, I can't wait to see what comes next uh, from this consortium and look for, look, you know, look for another paper and, and see how, um, see how this whole thing progresses. Really interesting work. Thank you so much for presenting. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it.